Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. Good to see all of you. I bring you uh, the greetings from uh, the other churches in our, uh, what uh, is really a a fellowship. It's sort of a national body of independent churches that come together for the usefulness of working together on admin things and financial, uh, not financial, uh, administrative legal sort of things. Anyway, that's the FECA Fellowship of Evangelical Churches of Australia. We just met down in Adelaide this year and it was uh, uh, my pleasure to be there and giving uh, obviously your uh, love to them. You didn't know they existed, but I gave your love. I hope that's okay. Uh, And and uh, 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 let them know that, um, well, we were doing a prayer and praise time, you know, and sort of what's the Lord been doing at your church? And um, I, I was really maxing out the time, just sort of not even explaining things, just listing the sorts of positive things that the God has been doing in our midst. And so I uh, praise God for all of that. One of the things which um, somebody thought that I misspoke and corrected me afterwards, but I, I had to correct him again. I said that we're, we're on our way to hand out 50,000 gospel tracts into our community and neighborhood and uh, country this year, and uh, uh, he, they were gobsmacked by that number, but praise God, you, you guys, you guys are doing it. Um, just, uh, uh, Reuben does the counts on it, and he gave me an update in about mid-August that we were, uh, we were 20,000 through our goal of 50,000 gospel tracts, gospel seeds being planted into the soil of our community. Um, and I, I announced it then and said, we want to do 50,000 by the end of the year. And within a month, he told me, actually, we're up to 30,000 now. We're making headwinds. So that's 10,000 in one month. Uh, praise God. And uh, uh, thank you for your work. Yeah, well, praise God. That's potentially 10,000 immortal souls that have now at least have the opportunity to pick up and read and hear the gospel explained in very clear, very potent language that they didn't have before. We're, we're praising God that he, and also praying that he would take those opportunities and, and, uh, uh, and light them on fire so that people are being converted. And we praise God. We know that that is happening. Can you look to me, uh, look with me to Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We are On our last couple of sermons in this tremendous book, I have the joy of announcing to you this. I have taken up the courage and listened to the exhortations of my wife. Uh, She's been asking for this for years. I've wanted to. I just didn't quite have the spine, but we're going to start a series in the book of Hebrews together. Okay, that's, that's the response I wanted. Very good. Uh, it's dense, it's heavy, it's Christ-centered, and it is God-glorifying. Very much look forward to uh, studying that together, of course, but we are yet a few more to do in 1 Timothy. Uh, we remember the context of chapter 6. If you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, we're very glad you're here, praise God. Uh, we're working through the book of 1 Timothy, which is Paul the Apostle's letter to young Timothy about how to pastor a church. And he's really giving them the foundational, most important principles that needs to be applied into a church. He's called the church, each local church, the household of God, where everybody has been born again. Uh, Not everybody that comes into here, but everybody that is really a part of the spiritual house. They've been born again by God's Holy Spirit. They know and love the gospel and follow Jesus. Uh, They have the Holy Spirit of God by which they do good works, put sin to death, and then get busy in the Great Commission, which is God's mission and God's plan on earth through the church. And in that context, he's given all of these sorts of commandments about what the church should do. Last week and the week before was really in the context of Timothy and through him the rest of the church being warned to to pursue great commission engagement, fighting the good fight of the faith, preaching the gospel, guarding the the word of God, uh, preserving a pure church, all the while fleeing from the covetousness that loves money. Covetousness and discontentedness that, that sets its heart on being rich. And Paul said, do not be in love with money. Don't even aim or hope or wish or dream about being rich. That mouth-watering dreaminess that you're that you, that you, that you, 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 you swift into and you lie back and you're sitting there and you're imagining mimosas on the beach, millions of dollars. Don't do that. Don't dream about that. That is a, that is a hook with a, a juicy piece of bait upon it. And anybody who loves riches and then sets their life in such a way as to make money as their ultimate goal end up being depressed, dissatisfied, and eventually, Paul even says, in many cases, suicidal. It's a distressing depressing, soul-crushing load that, that, that turns to ash in your mouth once you take it. Riches are not actually able to satisfy like they promise. And so this has been our context. We come to this point in verse 17 where he now addresses not those who are just desiring to be rich, not those who are maybe poor, wishing they were rich, but those who are Christians in the church 
and who are genuinely rich. So look with me to chapter (coughs) 6 and verse 17 as he commands Timothy to talk to them. He says, as for the rich in this present age, I love that, those who are rich for the moment, those who are rich until death. Of course, all Christians are rich in the life to come. So he's saying, but some of us are also rich in this life. So to them, as for the rich in this present age, charge them, that's authoritative, charge them not to be haughty. Your version might say arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, and thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. May God bless his word in our midst to his glory and to our edification. Amen. Amen. We need to start here with six points of Christian, basically a, 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 a upfront, foundational uh, Christian theology of riches and wealth. So as we go through them, there's some positives, there's some negatives. It's sort of on a, on a big balance, uh, a, a, a balance scale, and we're going to put one on each side and sort of see what, uh, the, how the Christian should think about riches. These are quick fire. We'll move into the exposition soon. But Paul, in what he says and commands in this passage, he assumes certain things. That if we just sort of start and go into application on therefore do these, we might miss a few things. So I want to make really clear the things that Paul is assuming as a biblical approach to riches before he then goes and gives us commands. We start here. Number one, Christians can be rich. Christians can be rich. Paul has said to Timothy to tell them, tell the rich Christians how they ought to behave with their riches. And he doesn't say, give it all away, you're sinning, you shouldn't make more than, uh, you know, a a, a part-time cleaner in in a volunteer society. No, he doesn't doesn't say you can't be rich. He's saying there's just certain things you have to do if you are rich. Some people say, well, Jesus wasn't rich. He goes, yeah, he's really rich now, though, isn't he? He ruled, he's the king of kings and lord of lords, the last verse said. So it's not riches that are evil. Paul said it's the love of riches, the pursuit of riches. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So Christians can be rich. Let's start there. Uh, No one is in sin just because they are rich. I told the earlier service, you don't have to come in here today and as the offering bag goes around, and I know it's gone so you can chase after it, and you go, oh, I'm rich, I'm really rich, and I need to give away all of my money and all of my funds and sell my Ferraris. You don't necessarily need to, but you are Welcome to. And I'm going to give a, a time of quiet solitude and just reflection now. If you, if you feel that that is on your heart and you want to, uh, you may. But nonetheless, Christians can be rich. It says in verse 17, God gives us everything to enjoy. So it's from him. If you're rich and if you're poor, God made you rich or God made you poor. Ultimately, he's sovereign. Number two, though, Christians can be rich. Number two, riches tend to make you arrogant and not trust the Lord. Riches have a gravitational pull. It's impossible to have it and not be swayed to some kind of way. Uh, Mechanics know this as they're building a car. You put more and more and more torque into a car, more power in the engine, the whole car will veer one way or the other and they have to offset that in the building of the car lest it go off the side of the road with all its power. Riches are like that. The more you have, the gravitational pull will increase your tendency to forget God because you have riches, to lean on self because you don't need God, and therefore to be haughty and self-reliant and proud and arrogant. So we're going to look at that today as well. Thirdly, here's a a bit of another uh, negative on this side. Riches are uncertain. Riches are by nature uncertain. That means that whenever you're thinking about your budget or your wealth status or your future or your your riches, you always have to put in, uh, hopefully not fine print, but large bold print, the big bracketed for the moment. Here's here's our annual family income. Here's our assets. Here's our net worth for the moment because we have no idea what might happen. Uh, One of us might be severely injured, the income drops, and what usually happens? Oh, the uh, income insurance finds a little loophole and you get nothing. Uh, Workers' comp doesn't actually come in, and now now we're poor. 
Now we're relying on handouts or asking for help from others, and the bank has sold everything of ours. What did the Lehmans teach us? The Lehman brothers, uh, they were worth, their banking trading institution was, was worth $600 billion. That's with a B. $600 billion at the close of financial year in 2007. What happened in 2008? The global financial crisis where real estate flopped, the bubble burst, and basically your houses and lands became worth almost nothing. Retire, the retirement savings plummeted in value. The Lehman Brothers claimed uh, and, and uh, uh, declared bankruptcy by the end of the next financial year worth zero dollars. Completely uncertain is riches. <coughs> Fourthly, this is on the positive side, material gifts are for our enjoyment. So, 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 so let's not think of riches and what you have as sort of a pun necessary punishment from God or that you're supposed to be miserable about what God has given you. It is good to be thankful. It is good to use what you have for your enrichment, for the joy of your family, for the benefit of others. It is given by God for enjoyment. Don't feel guilty about riches. Fifthly, preachers and churches have to be honest and open and mature in talking about money. Uh, Paul commands the senior pastor, Timothy, in this principal sort of textbook on how to do church life together as a family of God, Paul commands Timothy, commands the rich people to act in certain ways. So highlight the rich, alert the rich, use the word rich, say the word money, talk about giving. I know it's awkward. I know most churches want to avoid it, but it's really just an immaturity that leaves an enormous part of people's lives undiscipled. But we have a conviction here at Hope Church that all of our life comes under the authority of Jesus Christ, which means all of our life is spiritual in one way or the other. So the gold coins and the paper notes that you have and the numbers on your bank account screen, those aren't spiritual. But money is only ever spent by spiritual entities, which are people. People are spiritual. Everything we do is spiritual. That's why 1 Corinthians 10 tells us Everything you do, whether it's eating or drinking or anything else, spending, buying, trading, investing, every, signing a contract for a job, every part of our actions as a Christian are done spiritually, and so they are either done in fidelity and service to Jesus or in idolatry and infidelity against Jesus. You need to make sure that we are serving Jesus with our money. And therefore, preachers and churches, we just have to talk about it. And number six, here's our foundational principle for a theology of riches, is that riches give an opportunity for kingdom service and rewards. With money comes just a U-Haul, an entire 18-wheeler, jam-packed full of opportunities. That if you're a impoverished, working day and night just to eat enough food, to survive until tomorrow, to go and work day and night, to just survive until the next day, and your wife is at home, she's bustling around just to get enough wood, to put enough fire together, to boil enough water, to have enough clean water to drink and wash so that we can get dirty again tomorrow, collecting the wood to make more fire, to make more water, to make more cleaning. If that's the life at which billions live, they they lose out by necessity on so many opportunities to be able to do good for others. Well, that's not a sin on their part. It just means that riches give opportunity for greater kingdom ventures and service. So these positives and negatives, these are the foundations of everything that Paul's going to say here. And we're not going to go through them systematically again and make application. But as we make four applications here that Paul commands and charges us with, you're going to see each of these principles sort of underlaying them. So let's look at the charges the warnings, the commands that Paul makes to the rich. Now, we're going to think, am I the rich? Or is my, you know, jet-flying, Lamborghini-driving uncle, is he the rich guy? I'm, I'm a uni student. I just live in a, in a flat in the city, and I get Uber Eats every night. I'm so poor. <clears throat> Right? So who's really rich? Well, basically the biblical pattern, the biblical structure is that if you have enough plus some, you're the rich. If you, if you like have any excess and you're not in the position that we were talking about before, just eating to get to tomorrow, relying on God, hoping we get through. If you have the ability to budget out needs, and, and I mean needs, like remember what we said a couple of sermons ago? Crumbs of food, cloths for wearing. If you've got enough for that, plus some clothes for tomorrow, maybe even next week, plus some money to put away and even meet other needs that are not precisely needs, but, but they're, they're, they're essential needs, things like maybe schooling or education or a cloak, maybe even a hat and some sunglasses, uh, medical needs and some saving. If you can do any of those, 
We are biblically, uh, historically, statistically, we're rich. We're very rich. And so this passage is to us. Here's what the first warning. This is an umbrella warning. Paul says, charge them not to be haughty, not to be proud, not to be arrogant. So don't be arrogant. Let's move on. Now, the question becomes, well, how do, we, how do I know? What, what does that look like? How do I know if I am haughty? What does that look like? What does not being haughty look like? That's the rest of the passage. So as he gives commands in the rest of the passage, in every instance that you realize I'm not doing that, you need to put up a tally and say, I'm being haughty in that regard. Being pride in that, I'm being arrogant in that regard, and I didn't know it. It is my experience as a pastor that most people who are proud, not me, but most other people who are proud, thank you, they don't realize they're being proud. And so you want to put your hand up and say, I'm not being arrogant. Oh, you just disagreed with the Bible again. That's the height of arrogance. What you should do is go, oh, here's the areas I didn't know I was being arrogant. That, that's our approach when we come to Scripture. We, we sort of take a knee, we let it clock us on the chin, and we say, thank you. Thank you for showing where I was arrogant, O oh Lord. And so Paul says, tell them, don't be arrogant. But then he's going to go through and show us what arrogance does and doesn't look like, what humility does and doesn't look like. Uh, he needs to say this because prosperity causes an arrogance and tempts the soul away from God. We see this in the Old Testament. God commanded in Deuteronomy 6, I believe it was, to the, disciples, the, the, the Israelites about to go into the promised land. He goes, when you go, ensure that the riches that you receive, do these traditions, do these ceremonies, remember the Lord, because when you go in and you face hardships, you will want to rely on God. When you go in, though, and you become prosperous and your family multiplies and you have people working the fields and the income's coming in, you will then be tempted to walk away from God. So the dual warning is don't worship other gods and don't through wealth forget the true God. And it's the same with us today. Pride uh, uh, is born out of enough, out of sufficiency. Uh, We can even look at Australia as a nation and her history to really see a parable of this. When Australia was first like founded or claimed by uh, the, the British crown and established as a colony on the east coast of Australia in 1780s uh, uh, or so, uh, she was a penal colony, which means that you were either here as a prisoner working in chains, uh, 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 tilling the ground and trying to establish the basics of a, of a society for the future, or you were one of the police officers who couldn't hold a job in England because usually you were a drunkard or you were illegal and illicit in your behavior. So they kicked you out to Australia to be a policeman. Tremendous policy. Look at how that worked out. So they all came here. The governors were often uh, 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 corrupt as well. And in those early years, the police force, uh, who was the government basically then, um, sounds like Melbourne, doesn't it? Bunch of prisoners and then police force government. And uh, <laughs> we love Queensland, right? We love Queensland. So uh, in, in, down there, they were, those men started an illicit and illegal rum uh, racketeering uh, uh, business where they brought rum from the islands uh, into Australia and they would bribe and pay the prisoners in rum. So they insa- do you know why Australia has such a grog-heavy, drunkard uh, reputation and statistic? Well, well that's why, in our very roots, uh, n- most of the population was paid in, bribed in, and addicted to alcohol. However, in that mess, in that impoverished mess, now they called it the land of opportunity, but it was just, it was, huh, most of it was desert. The rest of it was not yet tilled, labored, and, and, and farmed. And so there was a lot of hard work to go in, which would really take uh, uh, 50 to 100 years to become very prosperous. But in time, as, as the Christian influence came to Australia through missionaries, uh, church planting, evangelists, revivals, there was enough of a Christian tradition. We won't say that everybody was converted, of course, but there was enough of an Anglo-Christian mindset And there was enough genuine conversions that many households, many societies, many cities, many suburbs were were strong in their evangelical Christian morals and ethics. There's that churches had good attendance, families were fairly stable, and morality was on the rise. And the Puritan uh, Cotton Mathers had a saying where he says, religion begets prosperity. That's not prosperity gospel, that's just to say... When man is lost in sin, all of his actions, including his money, follows that sinful folly. 
and it leads to a destructive lifestyle. Now, some of those guys get rich. Often, the most of us uh, are impoverished by our sin. And basically, the, the truth bears out in the book of Acts 19 in Ephesus, where we're reading this letter from today, as well as many other examples, like in Australia, that when a man is saved, his affections change. So he stops wasting his money on gambling, stops wasting his money on alcohol, stops wasting his money on ridiculous pursuits, and puts that into savings account, feeding the kids, educating the kids so that they can be well employed, looking after the family, uh, investing in the wife, and those households, historically and by God's grace, are trained in good works, and the Christian lifestyle is the most prosperous lifestyle to live in a fallen world. That's simply the case. That says nothing about God's wisdom or providence that might bankrupt us in a moment. But generally, the Christian morals bring about prosperity. Here's what Cotton Mather said. As societies are Christian, mostly, and Christianized, that religion begets a prosperity. But prosperity begets discontentment and pride, which swallows its mother, religion. So religion often produces a prosperous people, but that prosperity then grows up, like, you know, you had a pet snake, and when it was small, it was really cute, but now it's growing large, and you leave it to your children, and then it eats your children because it's a boa constrictor. That's what prosperity is like. It's risky. It leads to pride. It leads people away from God, and therefore we need to be warned. Let the goods that God has given to you not lead you away from him, not, 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 not lead you to pride or haughtiness, but lead you to humility. So the question becomes, before we go into other specifics, do you have a haughtiness because of your wealth? Do you see other people in more disheveled houses, ruined cars, bumpers hanging off the back? No, it doesn't even have a registry plate on there. The kids come to school without shoes, without jumpers, stained. Uh, You see other houses just run down. And is your immediate response, they're less godly than you? They have to be. Look Look at their poverty. Um, that you're more godly, you're more righteous than them because you have much. Maybe even compare yourself to your past self. You know, you know, when I was younger, I was struggling financially enormously. Now I'm doing very well financially. I must be more sanctified. It's a tricky thought, a tricky trap, and it is not at all true. So we need humility to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought simply because of our riches. Paul then says, number two, instead of being haughty, be humble. Number two, it's don't set your hope on your wealth. Set it on God. Look at what he says in verse 17. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Pride, which comes from prosperity, if we do not submit it to the Lord Jesus Christ, pride uh, uh, sets itself up, and riches set themselves up, and the prideful, unwise man and woman will set their hope in in those riches that are developing. Uh, Hope is, in biblical terms, a sure belief about the future. Whatever you believe the future holds for you, and whatever optimistic or positive views you have about the future, that is your hope. The question becomes, what is your hope based on? So for the rich, they believe prosperity, wealth, uh, inheritance for my grandchildren, safety from uh, 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 poverty and all of that. I'm free from that. That's my future. That's a good future. That's a good hope. What's it based on? Well, it's based on my riches. Look at my bank account. Look at my treasures. Look at my worth. Look at my net uh, uh, income. Look at my uh, investments. That is the grounds of my hope of a positive future. And Paul says that is a shaky, shaky, quickly to move uncertain foundation. I have a friend who, would, uh, who was an ab sailor and a, what's the other one, a, a rock climber, and he had four broken ribs and a cracked vertebrae, which tell the story that you want to put your anchor in something more solid than yourself. You, when you're climbing rocks or swinging down rocks, uh, maybe some of you have done that, uh, maybe some of you have stopped doing that and you limp and we can see the connection, uh, uh, but young people, especially Aussie white people, uh, young people, <laughs> white people mostly, but uh, 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 have these weird hobbies. And one of them is rock climbing. And yeah, don't know why. We have lifts now. We invented that. We kind of <laughs> solved the lifting situation. But anyway, they do it for fun. Uh, it's like when, when people go camping for fun. 
We solved camping. It's called a house. Now, we like pretend technology doesn't exist, and that's our, that's our hobbies. So anyway, uh, they, it was like pottery making. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, stop pretending to be poor for fun. So anyway, these, these rock climbers, no, they have to anchor their, their, their rope, their eyelet, their, their anchor into something very solid or they will plummet and fall. And I had a friend who had put it into something that was actually a moving rock. It was not solid. And it came down after him and he fell. And this is what rich uh, people attempted to do is believe that their riches are a solid rock in which they can anchor their life and their prosperity and their future. And Paul says... Riches are so uncertain. They can come tumbling down afterwards, uh, after you and leave you at the bottom of the ravine. Uh, rather, we are to set our hope on God. Set our hope on God. That is that our, our hope needs to be set on the fact that God is unchanging. So he can't move, our hope can't move. God is a good giver of gifts for me to enjoy. That's what the verse says. I set my hope on God because he's a father who loves to give me things to enjoy. Does that make, make a lot of Christians just a little bit uncomfortable? God gives you stuff to enjoy for your family and your neighbors. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be joyful. He wants you to have mirth, this, this joy that laughs and celebrates and has thanksgiving and feasts with people. That's a Christian ethic? Absolutely it is. In the Old Testament, uh, there was one required fast. There was many required feasts. Amen, someone. We believe in that at Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Go home, eat the meat, drink the wine, enjoy the friends, sing the songs, praise God. That was, that's the command of the Old Testament often. Hallelujah. God wants us to enjoy it. He doesn't just want us to enjoy it. There's other responsibilities. But part of the reason he gives it to us is to enjoy it. And when you know that, you can look to God. You can say, you're unchanging, God. You have given me some things to enjoy, but you may take it away when you please. I've read the book of Job. I know you can take it away if you just want to use me to, 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 to show your own justice and sovereignty to other people. You can have me killed if you want to, Lord. You can remove my ability to work. You can let a, a financial downturn like a moth eat through all of my savings. You can do as you please, Lord. But at the moment, I thank you for my gifts. I enjoy my gifts. I use them uh, uh, in, in godly ways, as we're going to see. But that kind of hope that I'm prepared for, I will have what I need to eat and what I need to wear, I have that hope set on God, which means riches come and go, but my hope doesn't move. Our hope should more precisely be, as Hebrews 6 tells us, our hope is set on Christ. Our hope is set on God in Jesus, our Christ. Hope is an anchor for the soul. Wherever your hope goes, it's like it drags your soul along with it. If your hope is on this earth, then the earth's corruptions will drag your soul downward. If your hope is on Jesus Christ in heaven, then Jesus will lift your soul upward. And Hebrews 6 tells us that our hope is Jesus who has set an anchor for our soul beyond the curtain. That is beyond the grave, in heaven in glory. Because God, in all of his love and grace, came to the world in Jesus Christ and lived the life that we were commanded to live and gave us a perfect righteousness. And then he went to the cross and took our sinful humanity. And he went to the cross and died under God's final furious wrath. And then he rose again, declaring, I have paid for sin, I have accomplished the law, and I open up heaven's gates for anybody that comes to me by faith. Jesus was raised up in the ascension into heaven, and now anybody that believes in him, trusts it, all Christians, have this invisible, spiritual anchor union with Jesus so that our hope and our soul is set on God in Christ Jesus. That's an unmovable anchor. That's an imperishable riches that is set for us in Jesus Christ. And Paul commands this mindset, or more specifically, he commands Timothy to, to command the rich this mindset. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, we are to be humble, not haughty. We are to set our hope on God and therefore be content with whatever he gives us. Thirdly, we are to be rich in good works. This is Paul's commandment through Timothy. Be rich in good works. That is, as much, as much money as you make, your good works for the kingdom should increase in a correct ratio in an exponential ratio, I would like to say. That is that our good works um, uh, that he's talking about in this context is not just general good deeds. 
He is specifically talking about monetarily good deeds, financial giving. So uh, use your money, he's saying. Let them be rich in good works. They know how to be rich in the world. That's how they got rich. You know how to save. You know how not to blow all of your money. You know how to put things in a certain account. You know how to maybe, worst case, you know how to employ a financial advisor or somebody to manage your money. Uh, or you're good at at least not blowing it all. Paul says use those wisdoms in a spiritual sense to be rich in good works. The good works are specifically the use of money for the advancement of the kingdom. The use of money for the advancement of the kingdom, that is the advancing of the Great Commission. I love people, so I help them. I love God, so I serve him. And the full coalition of both of loving God and loving man is the Great Commission, where we preach the gospel to glorify God. So if I can use my money, if I have money, Paul wants me to leverage it, to think strategically, not just in the moment, I suppose I could give some to, oh, we're doing the prayer again, I'll put some money in the bag, or, oh, that's right, I should transfer $10, I, uh, whatever I've got left in the account, but that's in the moment, that's not strategic. Paul wants rich people to strategically plan and budget into the future so that we can leverage our goods in order to impact the greatest possible uh, the greatest possible service to the kingdom of God in the Great Commission. So I wonder, have you done that? Have you sought to be rich in good works? Using the money that you have well and for the kingdom. We can think of Frederick III, the elector of uh, Saxony, uh, who was known as Frederick the Wise. And he was alive in the 1500s. And though he didn't agree with everything that Martin Luther said as a reformer, He funded Luther's study. He funded Luther's housing. He protected Luther so that he could hide away uh, instead of being killed by the political magistrate. He gave a lot of support for the study and the printing and the propagation of Martin Luther's teachings so that we can say this, on a human level, we wouldn't have the, 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 the Protestant Reformation if it wasn't for Martin Luther and his teaching. In the same way, we wouldn't have the Protestant Reformation if it wasn't for Frederick the Wise and his funding, and his giving. Some of you think, I'm not called to preach, I'm not called to teach, I'm not a missionary, I'm just sort of going to float along back here. Pastors are rich in good works. Missionaries like Adoniram Judson, they are rich in good works. I'm poor in good works, but it's not evil works. I'm just kind of poor. Do some here and there, but I'm not one of those saints. Frederick the Wise gives us another example. He gives us that better example of using money for kingdom gain. We look also at a biblical example of Barnabas. Many of us would know Barnabas. He's the, he's the partner of Paul the Apostle on his first missionary journey. They split ways during the second because they had different ministry ideas. But he was, a, he was a, a, a worker with Paul. Before that, it's even possible he was a mentor of Paul as he went and grabbed Paul for Antioch, brought him back to the Antiochian church, vouched for him, helped establish him as a leader, and then went with him on his missionary journey. Barnabas, before he was all of that though, a poor traveling apostle and preacher. He was actually a very wealthy landowner. And Acts 4, verse 36, tell us that in the midst of the church's persecution and widows starving and uh, apostles getting beaten up and spitting out teeth and blood and praising Jesus for it, Barnabas was one, and they nicknamed him the son of encouragement for this. Any, you'd get any pastor would nickname you encouraging person if this is, was your ministry. He sold his lands brought his funds, tipped it in a wheelbarrow out at the apostles' feet and said, let's get some widows fed. Let's get some word out. Let's get some more Bibles printed. Let's get some, I don't know what exactly they were spending it on. Uh, but, But for the good of the kingdom. That's an encouraging brother. And God had not at that point gifted him with teaching and preaching and uh, given him the honor to be in our Bibles as one of the first missionaries to the world. But then in honoring uh, Barnabas's generosity and in honoring, I mean, he's now fairly poor. He doesn't have lands, but God used him to be rich in good works so that he would then be used for the kingdom in glorious ways. I wonder how many Christians might be able to say that they are average income in good works. We're talking about your financial income. That can be one or the other. But we, we sort of tolerate being average income, you know, this mean income of, of sort of my uh, Christian community. We all sort of do this amount, and I'm, I'm happy to be at that sort of income, and that, that level of wealth in terms of good works. I wonder if you've ever had a friend or maybe a sibling, and, you know, you don't really talk to each other about how much you make, and then one day you hear how much they make. 
And, you, and you're surprised that anybody would pay them that amount of money, right? It would, it is, if one of your friends, you are not worth that. Uh, but there's some, or, or maybe it's just somebody else. I'm sure everybody has had enough of this sort of situation where you, you hear somebody else's income and go, whoa, okay, money bags, nice. And they were, they were good, they, they weren't flaunting it, but you heard about it and you were, you, were, you were impressed, you were shocked. That's the level of good works Paul wants you to do, whether or not anybody finds out about it. That if somebody saw an actual complete list written down by, by some angel somewhere, if your good works, your investments, your generosity, your deeds, your kingdom ventures were written down and people saw them, they would be gobsmacked. I think we tolerate often to sort of be at the level where if people saw what we did, they'd go, oh, good on them. Yeah, you know, good. Sort of funding the church of Satan. They're doing good stuff. Paul wants us to be rich. Filthy rich. Filthy, rotten rich in good works. And in generosity. There was a man who was a business Britishman. He was a, a, a British national who sailed to Burma. And in Burma... Uh, he, he had a little bit of an interaction with Ann Judson and Adoniram Judson, who were American Baptist missionaries. And they were there planting the seeds of the gospel, and their lives are uh, amazing for the glory of God. But there, Ann had this, uh, tells this story in um, uh, one of her biographies where this British businessman had made an absolute killing on the sale, uh, you know, production and sale of Burmese timber. And he had made so much, uh, and he made it in pure Burmese gold, that he had all of this gold uh, 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 carted onto this ship, which had struggle keeping afloat, had all of this Burmese gold that he had made uh, uh, transported onto this ship, and he was sailing back to Britain. He was going to be set for many lifetimes, more lifetimes than he could imagine. And on his way out of the harbor, the Burmese Navy stopped him, escorted him back to shore, and alerted him of an unknown law to this foreigner, which is that Burmese gold can be mined and traded and utilized in circulation of the economy of Burma, but it is never to leave Burmese shores. And in a moment, he was a poor man. He had to go and trade it all for wood again and take it back to England and sell it for cents worth. He'd invested in the wrong country. He had, he had laid all of his hopes up on the riches that he was going, he thought, take with him, but he could take none of them with him. He had established an enormous foundation for a future life in Britain on a non-existent crumbling foundation. He couldn't take any of it with him. And that's what Paul says in the next verse, is tell them to be generous, verse 19, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. That is that, in self-absorption and consumption and possessions and materialism, we set up, we, we gain all of this gold for us in Burma, and when death comes, we go to leave this world and we're informed that we can take none of it with us. And what do we have left? But wood and scents and scraps. Paul wants us to be generous because in being generous, we are investing not here in Burma, but in Britain. But where, where you can have the gold that you have earned, that you, you can invest and keep the earnings. Uh, Jesus said this, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Don't do it. You may have treasures on earth. Don't lay them up. Don't collect them. Don't amass possessions and materials where moth and rust can destroy them and where thieves break in and steal them. But lay up, rather. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal them. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See what he's saying? It's like he's saying to this British businessman via telegram, do not lay up gold in Burma. You won't take it with you. The government will tax it. They will remove it. They will take it away from you. You can take none of it with you. Lay up for yourselves stores and investments and, and dividends in British stock market. That's what we're being told to do. Be generous in this life with your riches. Think of those who are in need and give. Uh, being rich in good works may, may mean, you know, as we've done sort of our series on 1 Timothy, there's been a hundred different areas of application that as a rich person, you could choose to invest in. We talked about widows and single mums, and maybe you want to volunteer with your plenty to pay half of their rent every week. A couple hundred bucks. 
Uh, maybe you want to volunteer to find somebody who's going to go to seminary as a missionary and a pastor. And they don't have a, 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 the fee help or they don't have a family in support of them. They're a first generation Christian. And you say, I want to help. I want to pay your ways. I want to help you be a preacher like Barnabas. Uh, Maybe there's, uh, there's, uh, you're thinking about the building fund that we're trying to ri- raise so that we can get somewhere that everybody can fit in in one service again and, uh, and, and more people can worship Jesus. Are you being, there, there's an opportunity. I mean, there's more than I could name and I'm not going to make an extensive list so that you don't think I'm making legalistic commands. But are you leveraging, budgeting, planning and scheming to be rich in good works and generous towards other people so that you may store up a good foundation for the future. Riches that you can take with you and enjoy forever. This is the command of Paul. In saying in uh, verse 19, he says here, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. He says also in verse 17, where we started, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. So he sets up this distinction, and he, 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 he highlights a very important line that we need to draw. That there is such a thing as this present age. There must be such a thing as that future age. He says there is such a thing as that which is truly life, so there must be such a thing as life that is not true life. And in considering this, I want to speak to those who are not yet Christians. Maybe by your use of money, you can tell you're not a Christian. You, you love this world. You give nothing. You're not generous. You're haughty. By way of teaching, you know you reject Jesus. You don't trust him. You're not a believer in the cross. Whether you're somebody who is investing huge in riches or just dreaming about it in the future, and that's what you're going to live your life for, Paul wants you to know that there is such a thing as life which you have now. That's why you get the sun on your face. You get to eat good food. It's a Work, make money, buy things. You get to breathe in God's air. You have life, but you do not have true life. True life, Jesus said in his own life, he said that true life consists of this, knowing God and knowing, believing in the one whom he has sent. He says it this way. He's speaking to his father. He says, Father, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So if you are alive, and even you're wealthy, and you're living, you are alive in this present age. And that is no assurance and no promise that you will be alive in the age to come. And it is no assurance that you have true life, which is knowing God and knowing his son, Jesus Christ. But if you will... If you will, from this present life in this present age, place your faith in Jesus Christ. You must know the one true God who made you and then who justly could condemn you for all of your sins, but you believe his word which says that he came in his son as a human to earth to fulfill all the commandments for us in the law, to pay off all of our debts that we broke the law of and then raise back to life after his sacrificial death to secure eternal life in the age to come, that which is true life. He earned all that and secured it for us in his resurrection, that that Jesus who was man and who died is now King of kings and Lord of lords. He sits on the throne of the universe and he promises me that I will be with him when I die, that I will live forever with a new body like his, that there will be a new heaven, a new earth, that riches will be irrelevant then, that this present age will pass away, that age will not pass away. If you believe in that God, you believe in Jesus Christ whom he has sent, then regardless of your financial status now, you can be forgiven, you can be cleansed, you can be alive by the Holy Spirit and you will have true eternal life right now and in the age to come. This is the most important consideration. This is the most important accounting you will ever do. Has this life, been given to Jesus so that I may have true life in the future age to come because that will last forever, either in heaven or in hell. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you. This text reminds us everything we have is from you. 
We may use it well or foolishly. It may be a, a real bind and a, a weight around our neck because we've got on ourselves in all kinds of debts or uh, 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 precarious living situations. But nonetheless, you are the giver of all good gifts. We thank you for what we have. Some of us have more than others. Some of us have much less than the average person around us uh, and even in this church. But whatever we have, we have you to thank for it. We ask, Lord God, that those who have much even in comparison to others alive today. We, we're all rich, historically speaking, but even those who have much now, would you help them to utilize their multitude of opportunities, their, their manifold and various uh, uh, bl- uh, 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 doors that are open to them to use their money for the kingdom? Would you enable them, Lord God, to set not their hope on the riches, which are uncertain, to not hold so tightly what slipped through the hand like sand anyway, but to, to throw it while they still have it, to throw it into the kingdom so that they will be sure to receive rewards and uh, 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 dividends paid out by it. We pray, Lord God, that you would make us sacrificial, uh, not, pr- not proud, thinking that we deserve our money for it is yours. Somebody else will have it when we die. Somebody else takes it when we pay for things. Please, Lord God, help us not to be proud, but humble, zealous for good works, investing in the life to come, and leveraging our goods for the sake of kingdom growth. Lastly, Lord God, we pray for those who are here and have not yet had faith, who have not yet placed uh, the, the care of their soul in Jesus' hands, who have not yet called on him to save them. We pray that you would do it in a moment. You would give their hearts that light and life of faith so that they can receive everything Jesus has done for us, to trust in him and to be found with eternal life now and forevermore. Father God, we thank you for all of your love and grace to us in the wonderful Savior's name we pray. Amen.